1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. You follow along as I read out loud. It says, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. It's like, don't forget how you got your job, pal. I'm the guy. That's, what, that's kind of what Samuel is saying here, right? Don't forget how all this happened, you know. Because he's getting to be a big shot in tonight's Bible study. Uh, verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. I mean everything, right? So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Now, this seems like a really harsh thing, doesn't it? I mean, I've heard this many times as a pastor. I like the New Testament. I like the Jesus that's a friend of sinners. This, the, you know, the God of the Old Testament that wants to kill children and nursing infants. And that, whoa, that, that's so harsh, right? That's so terrible. Now, you and I look at things based on what we see right in front of us. And for instance, uh, someone brought a baby into the service we would see that as a sweet little baby, right? That's we, but see, God, there is no past, present, and future with God. God sees what that baby's going to grow into. He sees the whole life of that baby. You and I think it's wrong that God would judge someone before they have committed their crimes and their sins. But God is the creator of all, and he has the right and the, uh, to do as he wishes. Now, that's not an explanation as to what's going on here. One explanation, how many of you know the story of Esther? Uh, the story of Esther, that, you know, Esther is, you know, she's the heroine, right? But who's the villain of the story of Esther? A, a, a guy by the name of Haman, right? And Haman is trying to get all of the Jewish people killed. Why? Because why? He he's anti-Semitic. He has a hatred of the Jewish people, right? Um, well, well, Haman was of the bloodline of Agag of the Amalekites. See, so when God says, I want you to wipe everybody out, God's looking all the way into the future and saying, no, wait a minute, a descendant of these people, one of those babies is going to have a baby, is going to have a baby, is going to have a baby, and they're going to try and kill all the Jewish people. See? So God shuts things down in a preemptive way sometimes. That's not a complete explanation, uh, but uh, in my notes I put it this way. The Amalekites committed the sin that is spoken of in chapter 15. You know, right as the children of Israel left Egypt, the Edomites, the, the descendants of Esau, that's the first name for the Amalekites. They wouldn't let Israel cross through their land. They wouldn't let them get water to drink. They just ambushed them, treated them terribly right as they had left Egypt. And God says, um, I know it's been 400 years since that happened, but you're going to be punished for that now. And that's a, that's a wild thing for you and I to consider that you know, 1445 B.C. is when this event happened. It's now about 10... 30 B.C., something, you know, about 415 years later, and God says, okay, it's time to wipe them out. Now that's, the, the point that I'm making of this is, is that there's this bitter rivalry for hundreds of years between the Amalekites and the Jewish people, and they kept nipping at the heels of and going after God's people, and finally God's patience has run out. It's not like God says, I'm going to wipe out you guys for what your great-great-grandparents did. You're as rotten as they are because you learned what they taught you and their parents taught them and so all the way back, right? And, and so God says, now it's time for me to deal with this. Now, I, I started by saying this is a classic example of why we need a Savior. What do I mean by that? Well, how many forgotten sins had the Amalekites piled on over the years? 
Even if an Amalekite wanted to make atonement for sin, I mean, he couldn't cover every single sin. I mean, this is going back and going back and going back. God keeps a record of all sin from the smallest and the least to the ugliest and the greatest of our sins, right? It reminds me of Rick's testimony that we saw a couple of weeks back when he was grappling with Catholicism and, and grace. And he said, you know, I had all the, I didn't know how many sins, if I'd done enough good to, you know, I, I needed a savior, right? Have you ever tried to contemplate how many sins you have credited or, or on your account as of this present date? And if you were to add that number to all of the future sins that God says, you haven't committed these yet, but these are all in your future account. And one day it's all just going to be dumped on you. I mean, if you committed four sins a day, I mean, that's 116,000 sins. I mean, that's over a ridiculous number of sins. There's no way we could confess everything right. And, and, and so all of this is just piled up and piled up. God said, there, you know, my mercy has run out. I'm going to deal with them now. And I'm glad, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm not an Amalekite, Right? I'm glad I have a Savior that paid for my sins at the cross, as we just sang of. Verse 6, Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, uh, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah, all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless... That they utterly destroyed. And he kind of gave God the leftovers here, didn't he? And we, we have the tendency to do that, don't we? We hear about some family that's lost everything and they need clothes and food and everything else. I go through my closet and I look for the clothes that I don't like, that I don't wear anymore. I don't wear that anyway. Let me give this to some poor guy that lost everything. Isn't that terrible? You ought to give him the best stuff you got, Right? Uh, Greg showed up at our house the other night, he and Wendy, in, in a shirt with a hole in it, and Tammy and I just tore it right off of his back. <laughs> and uh, uh, so Tammy said, well, give him a shirt out of your closet. I thought, well, I'm looking for a t-shirt, and I said, no, I better give him one of my polo shirts. I'm going to give him that polo shirt. So uh, <laughs> just don't show up at my house with a tear in it. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh me they kept the best didn't they they just killed all the maimed and the worthless and the sick yeah. no, no matter what Saul is given to do in our Bible study tonight the previous ones the future ones we're going to be looking at he, he always comes short of complete obedience have you noticed that Absolutely not. And he says he utterly wiped out everybody, but there were a few stragglers and stray Amalekites that got away. He's lying about that too. But, but he, uh, you know, in this instance, it, it says that he spared the king, and, and no doubt he spared the king because he's thinking maybe the king's got some secret treasure hidden away somewhere and he'll tell me about it. Maybe I can let him live and, and all of this. And, and kings always gave a little extra mercy to an, another king. Even though we're enemies, you know what kind of pressure I deal with as a king, and, right? And so he, he just came short of complete obedience. And, and, and it's, it's just frustrating to give somebody a task and then to, for them to do a halfway job. Isn't that something? I mean, that's, God told him something to do and he only goes halfway with it. I put it in my notes this way. Very few people surprise you by exceeding your expectations in life. Isn't that right? Most people, don't most people under-deliver? I, I know that's not none of you. It's not no, none of us, right? We're, we're the ones that exceed people's expectations, right? It's those folks that are not here that we're talking about, right? That under-deliver, under-deliver. I mean, parents see this with their kids all the time, right? 
you give them some little project to do, some chore, clean this, and you go back and check on it. What a half-hearted, halfway job. Go back in there and clean that again, right? I mean, parents see that with their kids. Teachers see it with their students. Employers see it with their employees. And so does God, doesn't he? You know that you and I are supposed to do everything as unto the Lord. If you have a job, you don't have a human employer. Your boss is God. And he's watching. And he wants you to do things with your whole heart. There are mediocre, I mean a lot of mediocre marriages because one or both parties are half-hearted, right? There are mediocre churches because the pastor and the people are just half-hearted. I mean, um, you know, we're all guilty, me included, uh, of of this halfway obedience, right? I mean, all of us. Um, But it's not a little thing to God. Why did everybody have to die? Well, I guess the first and the foremost reason is because God said so. And God has reasons that you and I don't know. I mean, this decision would affect future generations. There's a butterfly effect. The smallest thing affects things hundreds of years into the future. Uh, uh, One guy put it in a commentary this way. that All of these people were like a sacrifice. In other words, it was all devoted to God. I don't know if I, that jives with me because God isn't into human sacrifice. But that's what a, you know, a noted theologian put in his commentary. I just shared that so you know I read them every now and then. Verse 10. Uh, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Now, these are troubling verses, aren't they? I mean, God is filled with regret, and Samuel grieves all night over this, because Samuel picked this guy. And and I think we'll see in, in future Bible studies that Samuel really... If you were to corner him and say, who do you prefer, King Saul or King David? He probably would say, well, you know, King Saul, that was... He picked him and and everything, you know. David was picked by God, kind of. Um, But uh, uh, what does it mean that God was... He regretted making this guy king. I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. Well... Just because God is omniscient, and that means all-knowing, doesn't it? Just because God is all-knowing, that doesn't mean he has no emotions over things. If I knew that Annie was going to march, march up the stage and slap me in the face right now, would it hurt me any less? It would still hurt, wouldn't it? Even though I knew it was coming. And maybe I'd even brace myself a little bit. But just because you know something doesn't change the way you feel about it. God has emotions and he's, he's grieved over Saul and how this has played out. Even though he's not surprised by any of it. He's just, he's, the, the word regret here, nakam, it means to sigh. It means to breathe heavy with sorrow. Ah, <sighs> Saul. That's what God was experiencing. And you sure didn't let me down. Did exactly what I knew you would do. Half-hearted obedience. Just halfway. Always ad-libbing to do it on your own. Just your own little way. Verse 12. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went uh, to Carmel and, and indeed he set up a monument for himself and he has gone on around, passed by and gone down to Gilgal. And then Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. You see the exclamation point? I mean, he's really trying to butter the prophet up. Oh, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They, boy, they get everybody into trouble, don't they? 
They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. So he doesn't even personalize the Lord our God, my God. He doesn't say anything like that. He says, well, you know, the people saved all this, you know, for, for you. And, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. Now, notice that exclamation point. In the Hebrew, I mean, this is just shut up. Right? And I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. <laughs> you can imagine his voice probably, qu you know, a little quiver in his voice and all of this, right? Because, I mean, you can see all this playing out. God gives Samuel kind of a heads up the night before. He goes to confront Saul and Saul's like, hey, man, hey, you, prophet, blessings, you know, and he's buttering him up. And, hey, we've, hey, we've done everything we're supposed to do. And Samuel says, well, why do I hear that bah in the background? I mean, if, if you killed everything that had a pulse, like God said, I mean, what is that sound I hear in the background? And then Saul does this little damage control. Oh, well, we saved this for God and, and everything. And Samuel's not buying any of it. He just tells him, you need to shut up. And guys, this, this passage we're reading is the reason why we still need prophets in the land because they'll tell a corrupt leader what no one else will. Isn't that right? And listen, some of these people that stand at the corners with their Bibles that are part of the fundamentalist independent Baptist church deal and all of that, I don't agree with the methodology. I, I think that they're speaking truth without love in many instances. But I'll tell you what. Some people need to hear that kind of gospel message from someone that sees that they're living a perverse and a wicked life and God is grieved, yes, but he's also angry over sin. Now, I don't think that, you know, that's, that's not the way I would go about witnessing, but I'm not a prophet, you know? Uh, I mean, uh, and listen, by the way, prophets, that spiritual uh, calling of the prophet this is one who speaks forth truth with passion. They have this supernatural endowment from the Holy Spirit to say hard to hear things in a way that people can handle. Now, I've been a Christian a lot of years. And I'm telling you what, I've met a lot of guys that said they were prophets and they weren't prophets at all. They were just mean-spirited people that wanted to just take jabs at everybody, you know? We'd have our, first, our afterglow meetings, whatever, and we'd have to head some of these guys off at the pass because you knew they were going to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, you are all evil and you're doomed, and the Lord is going to pulverize your bones into the dust. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, pal, these guys are here because they love the Lord. That doesn't bear witness with the Spirit of God, does it? Sometimes you've got to have a prophet that will confront a, a wicked king. And that's what Samuel does here. Look at, um, look at verse 17. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? I mean, you were better off before you were a big shot. That's what Samuel is saying. Now you're going off making monuments to yourself, right? You know, the church leaders can fall into this. If the thing gets big enough, fast enough, they start naming buildings after these guys and seminaries after these guys and Bible colleges after these guys. Uh, Moody Bible Institute up in Chicago, do you think D.L. Moody actually wanted to have an institute named after him? I don't think that was the heart of the guy at all, right? But, uh, you know, people get to be big shots once everybody's telling them how great they are and, and all of this. And Samuel says, you know, you were better off before you were like that. Uh, why? Because God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You ever read that before? What does that mean? God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That means you make God your opposition when you get full of yourself, when you begin to get a proud heart, self-righteous, self-centered, self-pleasing, self-sustaining, self-self, me, me, me. Why aren't all the people around me living to make me happier? Oh. God opposes 
folks like that. But He gives grace to the humble. When you and I have a humble heart, not a me first, but others first mentality, God says, I will pour out grace. That charis, my granddaughter's name, means blessing. I will pour out blessing upon you when you put others before yourself. So Samuel basically is calling him on the carpet here and saying, you know, I don't really like this new Saul that's making monuments and all. Verse 18, now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Sam, he, he still won't own up to it. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And so here he is now blaming all of this on the people. And the, see, the, in God's view of things, the king was supposed to be looking out for the people. One day, many years from this time in, in history, a new king by the name of Solomon is going to be given the throne of Israel. And he's going to have a dream in which God says, ask anything you want of me and I'll give it to you. And because he didn't ask for riches or fame or power or any number of things, he said, will you give me wisdom so I can look after your people? God said, that's the heart I can bless. I'll give you not only wisdom, but I'll give you all the stuff you haven't asked for as well. Right? Here Saul, he completely cares only about himself and he's willing to throw the people under the bus here for what he has done. Oh my goodness, verse 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. God, God's not impressed with the sacrifices. See, because sometimes a guilty man or woman will give to release themselves of the guilt of living in sin. Right? Well, I'm not doing this, so I better give a little extra. None of you have done this, but this has happened to me in the past. People that I know are not living right before God. They uh, ask where the tithe box is at. And I tell them, well, it's in the back or something like that. And, but they want to put the check in my hand so that I see that they're giving to God. I'm like, I don't want, don't give me that. I don't handle the money. I, you know, I'm trying to live above reproach in this regard. I, you know, there's the box. That's between you and the Lord. You just go put it in there, right? And sometimes people are doing these things. Sometimes it is, we, people want approval and they, you know, they want to be pleasing to God. They think, well, then they, I'll please Pastor Philip or something. I don't know. But sometimes it's people that are clearly just not living right before God. And they're just trying to, you know, well, I'm not doing this, but I'm doing that. And that's more than most people are doing. You know, they have these ways of justifying living in a wicked way. And, and, and the Lord is saying, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. And we don't offer sacrifices now. We would call what we do the first part, part of our worship services a sacrifice of praise, right? We, we sing songs of worship. And if God were speak, if Samuel were here speaking you know, to us the word of the Lord, he'd say, hey, listen, uh, those are some sweet songs y'all are singing. Um, but the Lord would rather have some obedience than singing songs. What? You mean he doesn't like our singing? Well, yeah, he likes your singing. But he wants you to live a life of obedience first. I mean, don't sing a song that says, Oh, Lord, you're everything to me. I'll do anything. And I just want to... Yeah. And then go out of here right back into some petty sin stuff and not living for him and not yielding to the Spirit when he wants you to, to do something. The Lord would say, Listen, I'd rather you keep your mouth shut and just go out of there and start living something. 
It's a better form of worship to God sometimes. If that's not troubling enough, look at verse 23. For rebellion, the sin of witchcraft. What? Well, the, the words is and as in verse 23, that's in italics. That's not in the original Hebrew. They put that there to help it make a little bit more sense to you and I. What God is actually saying here in His Word is this. Rebellion is the exact same root sin as witchcraft. It's like they're twin sisters, right? Um, we don't think of rebels that way. I, we live in a day when we think of rebels as a very cool, individualistic kind of a thing that we applaud. Um, but God looks at rebels in a very n negative way. He says a rebel and a witch, that's pretty much the same thing to me. And isn't it interesting how many people claim to be followers of Christ in the church and their life, if you just look at their life, just a casual observer looking into the life can see their whole life is built around rebellion. I don't do that. I don't participate in this. I don't want to drink that Kool-Aid. I won't be a part of that thing. I won't do this. I won't do that. I'm doing things my way, right? Whew. Rebellion and witchcraft. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. What? See, as we're whittling through this, it's like nobody gets, gets out of here without getting beat up a little bit, right? And he says, listen, when you're stubborn, when God's trying to tell you to do something, you say, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I'm not doing that yet. I'm not doing that right now. No, 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 no. Maybe later, God, but not right now. Well, somebody else needs to do that, God, because I'm just not going to do that. Well, I, I wish I felt like doing that, God, but I still don't feel like doing that, right? We, we have all this rhetoric in our prayer life we bring before God and everything. He says, listen, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Like idol worship? Well, what's the idol that we're worshiping in our stubbornness? Well, we look at it every day in the mirror, don't we? Me. I'm my own idol there. I'm being stubborn about what I want to do. Jesus would say, why do you call me Lord, which means boss, and you don't do the things that I say? say. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also, he also has rejected you from being king. I mean, you're just basically done his is what he says. Verse 24, Then Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned for I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and, and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. I mean, he's desperate, right? He grabs the prophet by the robe. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Ooh. You've lost everything today and it's going to be given to someone who is better than you, says the prophet. And also the strength of Israel, is another name of God, will not lie nor relent. That means he, you can't pout your way around God and get, get him to back down. I mean, it works with everybody but God, doesn't it? A little pouting will work on just about everybody, but it doesn't work on God. He, he's, he's not a man that he should relent. He doesn't just, okay, give in. This is a final thing is what Samuel is saying to Saul. Well, then he said, I've sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. I mean, we, we look at these verses now and you realize Saul doesn't have a repentant heart at all. He's just wanting a little religious display before the people so that he comes off well. He's like a phony politician, isn't he? I mean, he's already, he knows he's lost everything. Now listen, he has lost the throne at this moment. 
Well, who has the throne? We won't get into it tonight, but you know, the next chapter, we're introduced to David, the shepherd boy, right? The moment Saul lost the throne, David received it. But you're going to have this interim period of years where Saul is doing everything he can to kill David to try and keep the throne, keep the control that he once had because he's lost it, see? It's kind of like how, you know, David is a type of Jesus and Saul is a type of the devil, if you will. Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth, right? At the cross. But for the last 2,000 years, the God, lowercase g, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, has been trying to stop King Jesus from taking his throne. Isn't that something? It's happening right in front of us all the time. So he's not really repenting. He, he's just wanting to come off well. Verse 32, Then Samuel said, Bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously. <laughs> and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. I mean, it's all right. we're past all that. I mean, everyone's cooled off now, right? I mean, you know, we know how the kings need to negotiate now. And I, you know, I'll live in one of the lesser, you know, palaces, you know, here under house arrest. That's what he was probably thinking was going to happen. Surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went up, went to Ramah, uh, Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted. He sighed, he breathed heavy with great sorrow that he had made Saul king over Israel. Why? Because this guy's just made a mess of things. Just made a mess of things. And what we see as this chapter comes to a close is how tough Samuel was, right? He's just a tough old bird, right? This king thinks he's gotten off the hook and Samuel's like, well, if you won't completely obey God, then it's up to me to step in and do it for you. Can you imagine what that looked like? I mean, to see this prophet wildly swinging this sword and just blood and... You know, it's like a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's, I don't know, it's a graphic. Oh, gross, right? And this is the prophet of God. But it says that Saul was, as tough as he was on Agag, he was heartbroken over Saul's shortcomings as well. See, because he didn't think it was going to play out this way. And he was the prophet. And what's the point that we make of that? Just because we're God's children, we read our Bibles every day and we pray and we're trying to live our lives in a way that pleases Him. Life doesn't turn out the way we think it's supposed to sometimes, does it? And we all get up some days and think, wow, I didn't expect that to happen today. I didn't expect this. And you know, the reason I think sometimes God allows these difficult, you know, for the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike, well, the unjust, when the rain of difficult circumstances is pouring down on their heads, they shake their fist at God and they curse Him to His face and all of this. But when the rain falls upon the just, God's people, they say, it is well with my soul. How do they do that? The Spirit of God shows up when we're in those difficult moments. He really does. And it's a, it, it's a special grace that he gives to his children when they're going through a difficult set of circumstances. Some people wake up to these terrible situations and my goodness, because they're God's kids, the world is watching to see if they're going to shake their fist like everybody else would. And when we don't, that is more impactful than miraculous healings and supernatural you know, um, miracles and all of those types of things. Because the world gets to see how Christians respond to the, just the difficulties of life. 
David Jeremiah is a good, solid Bible teacher. He's not a Calvary guy, but he's spoken at some of our conferences before. And he had a bout of cancer. It's been uh, several years ago now. And he said he was, he was shocked by how many Christians came to him and said, you know, Pastor, I'm just so shocked that God would allow you to get cancer. I mean, it seems like, you know, because you're, you know, you're, you're a pastor that maybe he'd protect you from some of that. And, and uh, you know, David Jeremiah said, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. And I'm not surprised any more than anybody else would be over these things. But he, you know, lived his life with cancer and went through all the treatments. And now I think he's cancer free. But my pastor, Chuck Smith, was diagnosed with lung cancer and he'd never smoked a day in his life. And he died, you know. Was praying for healing. Everybody at Calvary, all the Calvaries were praying for his healing. And the Lord took him on home. There's no rhyme or reason to all this, is there? I mean, we can all live healthy lives and eat our vegetables and take vitamins and supplements. and You can do everything right, imaginable, and still be struck down in the prime of life. There's just no rhyme or reason to anything. But you and I, we need to respond to God by saying, Lord, I didn't expect it to go down this way, but I still want to worship you in the midst of it. That's what Saul was doing. That's what Samuel was doing over Saul, right? Ah, I like this guy, Lord. I didn't think he was going to do this, right? He was sad over it. I can relate as a pastor. I've, the reason I don't lay hands on people so hastily these days in ministry and give out titles and all this is because the early years of ministry, I did. I ordained people and named them elders and called them deacons and gave them titles and all these kinds of things only to see it instantly go to their head or to see them get off into some sinful thing or, to, or rebellion and, and mutinous situations and all this. And, and you know, I look back on many of those situations and I'm, I'm still a little heartbroken over some of those guys. Like, man, I didn't, I didn't think that brother was going to do that, Lord. That's, that grieves me that, you know, that, it, that it played out the way. I didn't, I didn't see it playing out that way. Right? So whatever we wake up to tomorrow, before your feet hit the ground, before you get your feet out of the bed tomorrow morning, thank the Lord for the day. Tell Him you've committed the day to Him no matter what comes in the day. You know? Whether you wake up with water on the floor or you go, you know, wake up to a day and one of the nurses is not at the VA and you're taking on all this, all the, no matter what you have before you get out of the bed tomorrow morning, just say, Lord, I commit this day to you and I want to, rest. I know I'm going to be shocked by some things that happen today. This day is not going to play out the way I'm anticipating it. Sometimes it's a much better day because some people are pessimists, right? It's like, wow, I didn't expect that. That was wonderful. But just commit the day to the Lord before you get, get out of bed. And let Him take you through your day and look for what He's trying to teach you through these circumstances and situations. I, I think Samuel probably got alone and said, Lord, how come you let me just take to that kid? I mean, he's just a good-looking young leader. He had some, he was a good son to his dad. He seemed like he was on the right track initially. And, the next thing you know, he's making monuments to himself and everything. You know, I look at Saul in this Bible study, and I, th I think I'm more like Saul than Samuel. Can I just be honest with you? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the Lord says, I'd love to do a little bit more with you, Philip, but it would go to your head, and boy, you'd start making monuments to yourself, and naming buildings after yourself, and you, 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 it would really mess you up. And so, it's better off to be little in the eyes of the Lord, right? Kind of keeps you in check and keeps your flesh in check along the way. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word tonight. Um, Lord, I pray that you would help us to completely obey 
whatever you tell us to do. Lord, help us not to give ourselves wiggle room and, and halfway doing what you've told us to do. Lord, none of us, if we're honest, wants to be halfway Christians. We, we, we want to commit everything to you. We want to live sold out, yielded to you. But Lord, we pray that you would pour out your grace upon us. Help us to humble ourselves and cry out for your help so you can keep on blessing us. Because Lord, the last thing we need in this world with trouble and the rain falling on the righteous is to have you as our opposition because we're prideful. So Lord, keep us from pride. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Next Wednesday night, God's going to get with old Samuel saying, now quit moping around and let's go to Bethlehem.